So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, well, I'm. Um, I like to look at um, the the spread of, of plants and have published on it. Um, but when I sat in front of these initial title mapping plant buns in four dimensions, I then thought, well, I'd rather like to give um, a historical perspective. And um, the real reason I want to give a historical perspective um, is that in 2016. Eric and I had um, similar presentations um, on um, the, the historical development. Um, and Eric gave a presentation on pollen databases at the Centenary of Pollen Analysis in Stockholm. Um, and I did one at, the, at a session at the IPC in Salvador. So for these, we were digging in, um, in these very old papers, uh, going back to von Post and, um, and the later. And we shared our um, our scans of these um, old publications, and Eric put them together in a in a nicer way and shared his presentation with me as I did mine. And so I like to use um, on this event, remembering Eric, some of Eric's slides um, in in telling a story um, on um, the development of uh, of mapping uh, past vegetation. Um, abundances and distributions in four dimensions, four dimensions of a fourth dimension of forces this time. As we all know, it it started with uh, Leonard von Post, and uh, not only did he uh, present the first uh, percentage pollen diagram, no, he presented um, a transect of pollen diagrams. Although uh, the pictures of these, they were not um, included in the publication um, of the presentation which came out in 1918. Um, the publication here by, by Magnus Fries actually contains um, the map where we see the 13 sites uh, from Northern Denmark uh, to Central Sweden, which Van Post sort of put together. Um, and here we have uh, the pollen curves for the individual taxa um, over these 13 sites. Um, even so, the, or even in the publication by, by Magnus Fries, um, there was only a black and white figure published and John Burks had colored it in to supposedly uh, the colors that were used by von Post. And the amazing um, part in this figure is that von Post only had one chronology, chronological horizon and that was um, a shift in the peat decom decomposition, which is known as the, the Grenzhorizont. And, and so with that horizon, he aligned all these pollen diagrams. And um, particularly on Fargus and Picea, we can see uh, that the, the sites in the south, we see a rise of, um, of Fargus, and northern sites, we see that Picea comes in. Compost later used these um, as an establishment of uh, pollen stratigraphy. So pollen diagrams, they took with them um, their own um, information on, um, on time. And somehow that seemed to work very well in Europe uh, for reasons that uh, perhaps we're not really quite sure about, but we have um, many features in um, vegetation history that are synchronous over large areas of the continent. But the next publication that, that Eric highlighted, and I also had in my talk, that's uh, from post for publication of uh, 1924, or the Süßwenska Skogens Regionale Historia und der Postarktis Tiet, or the, some features of the regional history of uh, forests of southern Sweden. And in there, he had um, a map of uh, surface samples, and this is an example of oak. He compared these surface samples um, to the distribution of oak. We see the distribution limit. Um, and Van Post noted that there's very little oak pollen um, in sites beyond the distribution limit of the tree. So he sort of tuned in on, um, on testing how much can I um, reconstruct the distributional limits with pollen. He also noted uh, that inside the limit, the oak in relation to its present frequency is rather too little than too much represented. So he also looked already at representation factors. But very interesting is then of course his um, application of these uh, two fossil sites. So this was published in 1924, just a few years after he was actually coming up with, uh, with percentage pollen diagrams and his 
his lecture in 1916. Um, so we, here we see uh, four time period, the periods, the recent one being the last one, and um, the distribution of, uh, of Fagus and Carpinus. Um, and here we see the maps for, for Pizzea. And um, on, these, on the map for Pizzea, we can actually see that the patterns that we see there um, is pretty much the same as um, in the patterns that we see in, um, in modern analysis of this sort of type of which I have done one. The only impressive thing here is that um, our modern analysis, they use less fewer data points than, than what we have here. And Eric noted that for Van Post to make these diagrams, he had to assemble, organize, extract, and process data in some way. In other words, he had to use uh, or he had to create a database, although that name or that term had not been invented yet. Um, another important milestone was then the publication by Suffer. And what Suffer had done was to move away from um, these, these points of um, um, indicating the amount of, of pollen at the site, uh, to interpolate over these points and make um, isopols and present isopollen maps as he did here for Poland. And this is the example of Pizia. The event of uh, radiocarbon dating was of course um, super important. And based on this, Margaret Davis was then able uh, to produce isochrone maps by mapping the time at which a particular tree taxon um, established and um, a location and put these on a, a common radiocarbon um, time frame and sort of make these, these um, isochrone maps. Just only one year later, um, isopol maps came out for Northeast North America. And um, the most important thing here um, is that these maps are based on um, a collection of um, actual pollen data um, in the COMAC project that was uh, earlier mentioned by Rashid. So these was, um, although not a real database behind it, um, there were original data counts behind it. And these were the beginning where the, the data sets, they were the, the starting point for the North American pollen database. Um, Rashid had also shown these, so the impressive atlas uh, put together by, by Brian Huntley and John Burks um, with isopollen maps at 500 year intervals, which um, is very impressive even today. Um, mapping 46 taxa, uh, using pollen, using over 400 pollen diagrams and over 400 locations for surface samples. Um, they, they used um, published, mainly published pollen, data, uh, pollen diagrams, um, but they already used computer programs to help them um, assemble the data um, and make these, these final, these initial maps, which they then call it in. And this is an example for Picea and also these uh, has not changed much um, to the maps that we can make today. In North America, um, these, uh, the, the final maps or the other um, isopollen maps um, are then found in, um, in, the, in the book of the geology of North America. And here we see that um, Eric's involvement uh, was also there in 1987. In Europe, and now I'm I am very embarrassed because I now realize that I used an old version of um, of my presentation. So that's okay, Thomas. We are fine with time. So yep. apologies to all attendants, <laughs> but that's fine. No worries. No stress. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry about this. Here we go. It's okay. Yeah. Not to put more stress on you, but we are almost 120 people now here. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, no. Now I have so many things. Okay, now it should be, no. It's coming. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. This is still the wrong. Sorry. 
too many PowerPoints open. Okay, now I do the share again. Okay, now there should be this one. Yeah, I think this is, this is probably the right one. This is probably the right one. Yeah. yeah. This was also mentioned already by Rashid. So um, in Europe, a different era came around. Uh, the phylogeographers, uh, they were mapping um, DNA haplotypes in, in space, and they needed um, a paleo perspective to put it all um, into, into perspective. Um, and here we see the example of, uh, of Simon Brewer, uh, together with, uh, with Rashid Chidadi, putting together the, um, the map of Krakos that we also quickly saw in Rashid's presentation. So this was how the, the development um, went on, on in Europe. Um, however, even this presentation or this publication by, by Simon uh, used um, still radiocarbon um, chronologies. So the chronologies were not calibrated. So there was a little bit of uncertainty um, in the interpretation of the maps, particularly since radiocarbon time scale runs not on a, on a linear way. Um, this then changed um, after the, the open scientific meeting of the European Pollen Database. Um, there was uh, new activity and a small group of, of people sort of came together and gave themselves the uh, funny name MATCAP, which was standing for Matting, Mapping and Data Accuracy Group. Um, I believe it was Ralph who invented this, uh, this acronym. Uh, which stayed with us for, for some time. Uh, out of this group, then finally um, came these maps, which um, unfortunately are static, but are using uh, a much more recent version um, of the European Pollen Database. And so we are basically visualizing now what's, what's in there. Um, together with Simon, I went on and uh, we then interpolated over these points and giving um, or recognizing that different pollen types produce different amount of pollen, uh, we created um, just four categories that we were mapping here. So we're mapping different abundance classes and interpolating first and then during the classification. And particularly the um, interpretation of um, the northernmost limit of these distributions um, then allowed us uh, to look at uh, rates of spread or rates, rates of migration, if you wish, by just comparing um, pixels in, in one uh, map to the next um, time step. Now it came um, this publication with these um, box plots. And what is interesting here to see is that we find um, taxa that show very similar pattern in uh, terms of the early Holocene spread, for example, Covilus and Ulmus, uh, they run in the early Holocene all over the place and, and occupy um, Europe, but they have completely different um, dispersal modes. So one has a heavy nut and the other one has a very light uh, winged seed, which is wind dispersed. And the same thing we can see for Krakus and Telia, uh, similar pattern in terms of early Holocene spread, uh, but different uh, dispersal um, units. And here, even for the latecomers, Fargus and Carpinus, um, similar um, trends, but different dispersal modes. So using these, using um, then these digital maps that we, we have now available, we can all then also do other things. And this is just one example here. We can look at the, the gravitational center um, of these distributions, and we can see or, or compute how the gravitational center is shifting um, from the Mediterranean northwards um, or um, towards the Atlantic. And we get, or we, we can see very interesting patterns, uh, particularly in, in, in Fargus and, and Picea, where we see that towards the present day, the distributions of these two trees, they move towards the Atlantic coast. In Picea, we see a very interesting pattern also um, with respect to a, a north-south trend. And that is that in the early Holocene, uh, we see that it's most particularly the spread um, of the tree in the, in the Carpathians so in more Southern Europe um, that attracts the gravitational center. And then the spread in Scandinavia sort of pulls that up north. This is just an, an, an example of what we can do now. So it's, 
at really allowing us um, to map the distribution and the um, abundance changes of our most important taxa in, in Europe um, in four dimensions. It still remains um, difficult in some places to really make sense of these and to understand uh, why these, these patterns are happening. So with this, I'd like to conclude. I'd like to say that databases uh, provide the tools to study uh, past changes in plant, plant distributions and abundance in four dimensions. And I hope I give you, gave you a few examples. And we have to thank, or I want to thank foremost Eric Grimm that uh, these tools and the containing data sets are available to the scientific community. We have a working European pollen database that allows the mapping and analysis of continental scale data. Um, and Eric um, convinced the European community uh, rather early on um, to move into Neotoma. And um, he took um, part of that burden. And for example, that he um, posed, um, moved all the um, European taxa names into Neotoma. So while we can readily expl explore the patterns of vegetation change in four dimensions, the reasons for some of them remain hidden and a topic of discussion and further research and hopefully further use of um, these continental databases. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Graciela. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Even with uh, the little yeah. 